Welcome to the Recovery 2.0 online conference. I'm your host, Tommy Rosen, and today I am just thrilled to be speaking with Dr. Partha Nandi. Dr. Nandi is a practicing physician, international best-selling author, and the creator and host of the Emmy Award-winning medical lifestyle television show, The Dr. Nandi Show. It airs weekdays in over 90 million homes across the U.S. and in 90 countries worldwide. Dr. Nandi is also the chief health editor at ABC Detroit. He travels the globe speaking on how to be your own health hero, which includes his no-nonsense approach to food and fitness, how he combines Eastern and Western philosophies, and the science behind the amazing health benefits of spirituality, mindfulness, and community. Dr. Nandi, I've been waiting for this one for a long time. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and great spirit with the Recovery 2.0 community. Welcome. Tommy, thanks for the opportunity. I, I really admire your work and, and I've, I've personally experienced uh, some of your magic with my own family. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to your audience and you, you know, and so I've been looking forward to this as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Nandi, I tell you, I've been to a lot of doctors in my life. Uh, as I think everyone in this day and age has been to a lot of doctors and me being a person in California and being prone uh, to the lifestyle of yoga, I've been to a lot of healers. But it's very rare that I have found any medical doctor in the United States of America who would pull out their, their script pad and write a script to somebody for yoga <laughs> or write a script to somebody for turmeric. And, and you do that. And I want to understand the man who does something like that. Well, you know, I, I always, um, I tell my patients that I'm one of those guys who shows up at the company bowling. Uh, you know, you, you got your bowling event, right? I'm the guy who is, I feel like I'm the, the, the plant that has been, you know, on, on the professional bowling team, the PBA, or the guy who's the, you know, former uh, semi-professional baseball guy who comes to the baseball game. And why I say that is this, because I was fortunate enough to come, come from a country, I was born in India, and I came to the United States at age nine, and I was blessed with parents that really told me what to do. So for me, growing up, you know, yoga, meditation, prayer was a way of life. It wasn't this alternative, you know, place you had to go to or something that was not quite mainstream. It was what was every day to me. And why that's important is because I grew up with that and I realized the tremendous importance of that. A billion people, a billion people, right, uh, believe and, and understand the importance of things like yoga, spirituality, the importance of, of, of food as medicine. I mean, turmeric and all of its anti-inflammatory properties, its immune system uh, properties, has been around for thousands of years. And I was privileged to know about that before a lot of my colleagues. So with that in mind, you know, I was, what was also interesting is taught me is at a very young age, at age six, I was afflicted with a life-threatening illness. So I was uh, like any other six, I have a six-year-old boy now, so I know what my parents are going through. I was absolutely driving my parents crazy and, and until I stopped doing it. And then what happened was uh, I wouldn't do anything except listen to sports and I, that's all I would do, wouldn't eat, wouldn't want to go into any activities, hated school, I still love school, hated everything. And, and I went to a number of practitioners, both traditional practitioners, Tommy, and also alternative medicine. Can you believe I was covered in garlic for an entire day because mm -hmm. they thought that would help. And so, you know, after everything was said and done, my parents said, you know, we've got to take him to the specialist that we, we've heard about because he's not getting any better. We went to this doctor, and lo and behold, it was Christmas Eve, and I thought, listen, it was going to be just like every other doctor, Dr. Chandra Shaker, and I remember him even today because he saved my life. He said, unlike every other person that's been with me that time, so you, you need to admit him to the hospital that night. And I said, wow, Christmas Eve, and we have to go today? He goes, yes, and you know, I was poked and prodded, and at that time, I thought I was, this, this was basically I was being terrorized. But what was happening was that treatment saved my life. I was diagnosed with rheumatic heart disease. Mm -hmm. and, and the doctor really saved my life along with the treatments. And that began my journey into medicine. I really, something happened. I said, I want to be there when, when others need my help. So 
I, I have this background in my, in my life, right, of, of all the spirituality and, and knowing that food is medicine. Every Sunday, my mom would take, you know, turmeric comes with these little sticks. We would grind it to cook. So we knew the real deal. I mean, my mom would tell me all about the properties and how it heals. So I had that background. Then I had this tragedy that, tragedy that happened to me that I nearly took my life, and that propelled me towards medicine. So then I finished uh, medical school, and I, and I pursued a career in medicine. But I had this background in me, that background of spirituality that, that, that the Indian subcontinent had for thousands of years. So when I started practicing medicine, I utilized it in my, in my practice every day. About a decade ago, my dad, um, who was my hero, he was there with me every night. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, when I was in the hospital at six years age, he was a brilliant man, but he never missed a night with me in the hospital and he took care of me. That same dad had a, had a very, very catastrophic stroke and really then propelled me to do something that I'm doing now, which is understand how to advocate for folks. My, my dad's stroke really helped me understand that we need to do much more. I love practicing medicine. One-on-one, -on -one, I loved it. I love talking to patients, telling them all about my experience from the East, which is India, and the West, which is all this tremendous technology and medicine, right? The, the meeting was unbelievable, but I knew we had to do more. I knew that what was happening to my dad was happening everywhere. My dad, without my advocacy and my family's advocacy, he would not be alive for more than three months. The, the day he walked in the hospital, Tommy, they said, you know, this guy's is done for. Really, they washed their hands of it. And we said, listen, you know, this is the first week we need to do more and advocated for him. And my dad passed away last year. And we were, we had him for a decade, right? And to enjoy the birth of my children. And so me explaining the story is that you, I realized that I needed to give people the advice and knowledge that I had but not just one-on-one, -on -one, but to a, a, a tremendous group of people, meaning that not tremendous, but a, but a, a larger number of people, um, both via our major media, which is television. We developed a television show, which now reaches 90 million homes. We re reached a digital platform and social media. We reached millions throughout the world. But that prescription pad, I call it Parthas Prescriptions, as in a yoga and turmeric, because I really think that just reaching in your medicine cabinet for yet another pill Yet another procedure is just not the way to go. Sometimes you have to go backwards in, in order to go forwards. And, and, and you've taught the world that about uh, addiction and recovery. And so that's why it's, I'm a little different than a lot of my colleagues, I say. And I, and I hope it's the good way because I've got that background that, you know, my parents and, and, and that community they developed, they taught me everything. And my experience has taught me about medicine. I still practice medicine today. I'm, you know, I, I, I just came from my office now. And, and, and the thing is, I still believe that there are miracles that happen. You know, when, when I had a bleeding patient who uh, was an alcoholic and they had a blood vessel in their esophagus called the varus, varix, and they were bleeding out, they would be dead within minutes, if not for the technology of putting a scope inside and stopping their bleeding. And we did that just last week. So I love the combination of the two. And I think that's what we need to do. The new paradigm, yes. right? Treating not only addiction, but every other ailment is this. We've got to stop thinking that the only way to do it is the Western way, right? I think that, I think most people realize that there's unbelievable technological uh, innovations and pills that can do everything. But really, we have to go back and say, what does our body really want? And then go to the root cause of our problems and see, let's solve the root problems. Of course, let's also make you feel better, stop the immediate problem with perhaps a procedure, perhaps a medicine, but then let's go back to the root cause. Go back to our body's own healing mechanism. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that every cell in your body has one goal, and that is to make you thrive. And why is that? Because if you don't thrive, those trillion cells, right, they don't thrive either. So that, that's why I, I have that, that approach, and I'm, and I'm hopeful to be able to reach people and tell them that you know, there is a lot of hope in the future with, with our technological advances and our advances in understanding how our body can really do amazing things themselves. It's, it's, it's just an unbelievable one-two punch. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's, let's uh, just building on, on that wonderful philosophy you just laid out, Let's first talk about your five pillars. Um, so name the pillars for people. This is coming from your book, How to Be a Health Hero. 
And uh, this is an incredible book, which I read after meeting you in the airport uh, by complete accident. <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about the five pillars and because and, they're very, very uh, accessible. And, and this is stuff that people can bring into their life right now. Yes, I bought it because, you know, this, I'm in the airport and, I, and, and I've got this book. I'm on a book tour. And Tommy's at the airport and I show this to him. We talk and listen, you know, there are no accidents, right? I mean, this, this uh, gentleman is a, is a spirit and, uh, you know, and so we hit it off. And, and, the, and the idea behind this book, Ask Dr. 85 Steps to Become Your Own Health Hero, is this. I always want to make things pretty simple. I mean, you know, there's two ways to say red, erythema and red. Erythema, people say because they want to sound like they're smart or they want to sound like they're well-educated. But I would prefer red all day long. So my five steps are this. And I think they're really compelling, but they're also easy. Anybody can do it, and you don't need to have – a million dollars in the bank to be able to do it. So the five steps to me it all begins with purpose, right? Everybody has to have some motivation in to, to do something. Um, you know, my daughter, uh, I do not have to ever, Tommy, tell her to do one thing, which is to plug in her phone. Ever, <laughs> ever, do I have to remind her that you have to plug in that darn phone? Why? Because she knows without that phone being plugged in, she's not going to have that amazing device in her hand, right? This sucker right here, <laughs> you know, all of her friends are on it. So, and why am I using that example? We all have it because she's purposeful in her movement. She's purposeful in her activities. It becomes second nature. Well, how can we design our lives like her plugging in the phone? So it becomes second nature. So it doesn't mean that you have to, you have to move the, the, you know, the trajectory of the moon or change the planet's surface. It doesn't have to be as, Gigantic. It can be if you want, but to me, the first pillar is achieving purpose in your life. And that could mean, you know, small little components of purposeful activity. You're in a job, you know, you're, you're in um, New Jersey or you're in Pittsburgh and you're, your boss is, you know, hammering you and you really don't have a choice. You have to stay with it because you have to support your family. Get it. But in that day, find moments in which you can say, you know what, I want to help my coworker, or you want to do a volunteer activity, or you want to walk in the park, or you want to play a game of basketball, whatever it is, right, that gives you a meaning of purpose and fulfillment. That is the way you, you shape your life. Now, what I tell my patients is a simple exercise. In the, in the back of your bathroom door, in your, you have a blank piece of paper, somewhere that you see every single day. On the left-hand side, write down all the activities that are purposeful on the right, on the right-hand side, but the ones you think really are not so purpose floor, we really have no meaning. Once you do that and look at that every day, something amazing is going to happen. Over time, you're going to cut out the activities that don't give you purpose, right? And so why am I as a physician talking about this? Because every study shows that you can decrease diseases, increasing your lifespan just by having that one pillar, which is having purpose. Seven years of your life can be increased, quality of life, not the nursing home, but quality life with your family. Seven years increase in your lifespan if you just have purpose. Ten studies, ten studies, looking at all the stuff we look at in Western medicine, say that you decrease your risk of stroke and heart disease. Right, the two killers in our in our in our uh, society, also diabetes, and every disease state, including addiction. If you have purpose, right? If you have a reason. I call it a reason, raison d'etre, which means a reason for being, reason for you to be alive. If you develop that in any form, that'll really help you. And to me, it's one of the toughest things I've ever done. I have had to realize and realign my life to say, what is my purpose? To me, my wife and I jump out of bed. We don't just get out of bed. Why is that? Because we know we can change the trajectory of people's lives on the planet. And that to me, man, that juices me every single day. So that's my purpose. Right? And so you find your, your purpose, and when you do that, everything else will align. And physiologically, so what does that mean, physiologically? There's, there's this whole, whole paradigm, whole idea that's shaping all these five pillars, which is the what? The fight or flight response. So when you are purposeless, no purpose in your life, and you're wandering aimlessly, guess what happens? Your body is relatively primitive. It still believes that unrest means that something bad is happening in your survival. 
you're not getting food or you're not getting shelter, something's happening. Why else would you have unrest? If you had food, clothing, and shelter, you should be good. In your, our body's thinking of survival, you should be good. When you have unrest, no purpose, aimlessly wandering, that fight or flight response goes up just a little bit. Mm. But if it's constantly up, right, Tommy, what happens is that all those hormones, like cortisol, like epinephrine, all those up hormones are up all the time to a, to a small degree. And that does what? All those hormones. All those substances increase something that we know in medicine is the basis of all disease, which is inflammation. So just having purpose can reduce inflammation, reduce the diseases that are ravaging us, right? Including addiction, including autoimmune disease, cancer, heart disease. So just by the first pillar, which I actually think is one of the most important pillars, finding that purpose, it's not going to be easy. That's number one. Number two is... Hang on. Before we get to number two, I just want to quickly say that on the flip side of what you're saying, the happiest people that I know, uh, sorry, the unhappiest people that I know in recovery are the ones who wake up any given day without a sense of purpose. And the hardest days in my life, personally, have not been the days where, you know, things were challenging in the outside world, but they were the days where I woke up without knowing what I was here to do. Absolutely. And so very, very painful. And, and we encounter this a lot on the path of recovery as people are shifting their life from a life focused around, for example, drug use or alcohol or another kind of behavior. And they're changing their life now. And, and it's a little bit of an unknown, Dr. Nandi. They don't, you don't know what's coming. You don't know who you are yet. You're trying to, to find ground zero. So what you're saying, uh, I think, should hit, hit home with this audience quite a bit. And here's the thing, you know, I see so many millionaires come to me in my practice, multimillionaires, you know, they've got everything that society puts value in. All the, I call it surrogates, right? The make-believe stuff that tells you, you've made it, right? I mean, you've got the nice clothes, the big car, whatever it is, yet no sense of fulfillment. They come to me because, you know, as an as a internist and gastroenterologist, all the symptoms of discontent. Are there and that's the issue so you know you're absolutely right it's so difficult to find purpose that you cannot look towards what society values as really the stuff that we need to have right everything everything that's materialistic so you have to it really has to come from within and if it makes you really fulfilled to have a nicer house something wrong with that I'm just saying that that can't be that can't be the only thing if it's because everybody's told you so. You have to really go inside and say, what is it that makes you happy? In my book, I talk about exercises you can do, meaning that you know, what you can do to really find what makes you click. click. So that's the first, first flow. The second one is really important. And, and, and I always uh, paraphrase, there's a, a doctor, Dr. Mark Hyman is a functional medicine doctor, and he talks about the most important weapon, right, in, in the fight for good health is what? Before a fork, not some amazing diet or some, some plan that you can, you can press one and for $19.99 you can lose 15 pounds today. None of that crap, right? It's all about really sound nutrition. And what do I mean by that, right? Everybody talks about that. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that really, in reality, a restrictive diet is one that's, that's what? is another word for failure. I never use the word diet for my patients because I know the word diet means that there's no chance for success because whenever you restrict your body with anything that you say you need, you deprive your body again and again, you tell them that I can't have this, it's just, it's just meant for failure, especially with food. What I recommend is this. Whatever part of the world you're watching, find foods that you like that are in season in the part of the planet that you're in, right? Do your best that you can. The key is that you have to eat the, eat foods that are whole, eat foods that you know what the ingredients are, and you do as little processed food as possible. Foods with, if you're gonna have, if you're forced to eat foods in boxes or containers, make sure that anything that you eat, you can pronounce, and you know what it is. Hmm. If you can do those simple things, You've done better than 95% of the population. Having said that, fruits and vegetables every single day. And people say, well, Doc, I know that. But here's the key is that you have to really do that every single day. It's not just as a side dish. Think about vegetables as a main dish. Again, 
I am juiced because I am somebody who has been trained as a, at a very young age. And you know, Tommy, being in India, so many people use vegetables as their main dish, not just on the side with a little tiny bowl next to your giant piece of steak. It's not the idea. You have to pick plants over meat. If you can do that simple switch, every study will tell you that disease states will disappear. And, and why is that? Because plants have things called phytonutrients. So in English, that means plant nutrients, nutrients that are there, that have been there for thousands of years. And why that's important is it's not that all meat is bad or that, you know, eating things that are, that are um, been processed are bad. It's just that our bodies haven't been able to adapt to any of that stuff for more than what, 10, 15 years, sometimes even five years, but it's been able to adapt to the diet I'm talking about for thousands of years, right? Thousands of years we've been eating plants, we've been eating vegetables and fruits that are grown and foods that you can see. So the idea is that you want to be able to give your body what it needs. The concept is that you want to feed the 40 trillion little bugs that in, are in your body, and that's called the microbiome. It used to be that we would think that the human body is there and then there, there are all these bugs, but it, it's almost like if you can think of it in a different way, if you can think of the 40 trillion bugs that are in your system that produces substances that we now know that affect all kinds of behavior, including addiction, right? We're talking about serotonin, we're talking about dopamine, we're talking about fatty acids that can go to the brain and really communicate with your brain. We're talking about the longest nerve in the body called the vagus nerve, which connects the brain to the gut. So whether you're trying to recover from addiction or you're somebody who's trying to fight diabetes, having foods that are whole that your body can use is so critical. And why is that? Because you have to give your body the substances it needs to have a fighting chance. And I've talked to Tommy about this. You know, when you talk to folks who are addicted or even folks who are deep in disease, it's hard to find people like that who actually have great nutrition, right? Most people are eating out of a box, out of a can. Their, their, their whole idea of nutrition is just put something in your body to make you feel full. It has to completely change, right? You, if, you're, if you're suffering from addiction, I would say the first step, the first step, Nothing out of a box or a can. I actually heard from a recovery center, you know, somebody went to a rehabilitation center and they said, well, it was a great night. What we did was everybody had a great time. And instead of talking about whatever substances they were actually addicted to, we went and we had a great night and we had, guess what? A bunch of desserts and candy, and pasta. It was fantastic. What a great environment, Dr. Nandy. And I said, well, it's, it's fantastic that, that, that you felt that way, but really you went to the first drug of addiction. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, well, sugar is the first drug of addiction. Yeah. That is the first <laughs> drug that tells you, brother, this is how you can feel, right? And it gives you that whole surge in your brain. In the, in the part of your brain that's really primitive, right? It's what we call a reptilian brain. The reptilian brain is a, is a part of the brain that you're not using your cognitive ability. What I mean is that you're not thinking about stuff. You're going by instinct. So isn't it interesting that you're in a, a treatment facility and they're giving you candy, sugar, and dessert, right? So, so you're, speaking, you're speaking my language. <laughs> what can I say? I, I, I won't say much during this interview. I don't oh, need please to. Please do. No, I won't need to. You're, you're covering it beautifully, and, and we'll get to the other three pillars. I just simply want to ask you a question. Um, you said that we have about 40 trillion critters within us, the microbiome in our gut, and you're talking about those critters actually producing neurotransmitters. Not us, but those critters actually producing neurotransmitters that are affecting the, the decision-making process that that we, the human being, is making. Is, is that correct? Yes, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's almost like, you know, who's really in control here, right? I mean, I'm not saying that we're, we're robots here being controlled by, by these, these organisms. And it's not just bacteria. Everybody says, well, doctor, tell me the right 
bacteria should have? Well, you know, there's bacteria, there's fungi, there's protozoa, there's everything all in there. And so you're absolutely right. They're producing substances that affect your body. When you look at the trillion or so cells you have, and you look at the 40 trillion you have of the bugs, and then let's talk about the DNA and what does the DNA do? So for people who are not familiar, your, your cells, right, have DNA. So the DNA then has a imprint, right? It kind of has almost uh, a, a, an imprint tells you, the DNA tells the cell what to do. So it produces these products called protein. So let's say we have a trillion of those, right? And we produce our little proteins. Well, you got 40 trillion on the other side producing stuff. So tell me who's really producing the stuff that affects your body. Yes. And why that's important, I write in my book, is that you are not your genes. You are not your genes. It's not to say there are no effects from your heredity, but it's still less than 15% of your life and what happens to it is really you can go back and say it's because my dad, my mom, my sister, etc. You can really change your entire paradigm. You can change your entire trajectory. Your North Star can be different. And that's what I mean when I bring up the microbiome. We now know that depression is related to the kind of bugs you were, you had when you were a kid. Addiction. You in the dirt. Addiction, addiction as well. Absolutely. There has Absolutely. to be a connection between what's going Absolutely. on in the gut and addiction. So you, you were talking about depression, diabetes, addiction. When you talk about what kind of bugs there are in your body, and you can correct them, correct them. Now you actually have ways to do something about it. It's not just, well, I'm done. It's okay. I've got bad bugs. I'm over. It's the fact that what you put in your mouth is the number one, two, three, four, five ways in which you can actually change the paradigm. So shifting back to my second pillar, what you put in your mouth can affect these bugs who are actually connecting and, and controlling so much of what you do, including your behavior of addiction. So I will, go, I will go forward and say, if you do not change your nutrition, you have a slim to zero chance of succeeding in changing your behavior of addiction. Mm -hmm. And so that is so fundamental to understand because people don't talk about that. I had a patient that came in who had hepatitis C. He came to me just to get a prescription. He said, Doc, I need a prescription because if I don't get that prescription for this drug for hepatitis C, they won't let me back in the rehab center. And I asked him, I said, what do you eat? He goes, what does that have to do with anything? I said, everything. And nobody had talked to this 30-year-old man who had been to rehabilitation five times in the last 18 months. Nobody had talked to him about nutrition and what happens when you put solid nutrition. You can give yourself a fighting chance. So that's really critical, and I think people need to understand that. The third pillar to me is just as important. But to me, you know, uh, when I was growing up, uh, Tommy, Michael Jordan, I love Michael Jordan, right? I remember there was a game. I don't know if you're a basketball fan or not, but people who are basketball fans remember game six. Michael Jordan has got, got the flu and the fever, and he looks like he's about to die, and yet he puts in like six three-pointers and wins the game. That was Michael Jordan that people knew. What they didn't know about Michael Jordan is this, that he was taught a technique called mindfulness. Called mindfulness that really changed the trajectory. Michael Jordan was always a fantastic player. But Michael Jordan thought about Michael Jordan and said, I want to score points until he was trained to understand the importance of spirituality, the importance of cultivating the mind. Phil Jackson was his coach, and he brought in a mindfulness expert, Chicago Bulls. Yeah. And Michael in the beginning said, yeah, you know what, I'm a basketball player. What is this guy? Is this voodoo? I don't want to hear about this. And that year, Michael didn't get past, I think, the first round of the playoffs. But, All right, I'll give this a try. After he understood just the beginning concepts of mindfulness, what does he do? He wins one championship, second championship, three championships. I think and then he retires, unretires, and wins three more. The point here is that Michael Jordan is a professional basketball player, cultivates his mind to achieve his goals. As a healthcare practitioner, I now see evidence everywhere that mindfulness can do this, can make every treatment, every treatment regimen, whether it's for addiction, whether it's for treating diabetes, whether it's you know, for treating depression, all 
better. And again, I go back to what I talked about in my first pillar, which is the fight or flight mechanism. When you cultivate your mind, that unrest and that stress that you have created for your body in a, in, in a small degree can really change. So again, I'll talk about cortisol, epinephrine, all of these, all of these substances can completely change. And guess what? Now, with cultivating the mind, whether it's yoga, whether it's meditation, whether it's prayer, whether it's walking on the beach, whatever you need to do to be able to cultivate that mind, that also does something amazing, right? It also changes your gut flora. Imagine that. Cells change based on your spirituality. Now you can actually see evidence. We all knew it in the spiritual world, but now Western science is catching up. The people who actually are spiritual have less damage. Their, their cells are actually changing. So why is that important for addiction? Now, we know now the evidence, associative evidence, that if you could even, even have the beginning concepts of meditation, your chances of decreasing your dose of opioids increases by 50% with just the beginning ideas of meditation. Beginning level, level meditation. The experts, 75 to 90%. Astounding. Better than most treatment centers, right? Better than most treatment centers. So to me, when, when Tommy, is, I'm sure, has mentioned, every three weeks, the same number of people are dying from opioid crisis, opioids. Every three weeks, the same number of people are dying from, from the same number, from opioids that died in all of 9-11. This is a crisis, and you get a simple technique that's within your body. What, it, what, what does meditation do, right? It brings in all of those substances that can change your behavior, change your life. And, and again, we're talking about addiction, so it can revolutionize the treatment of addiction, as Tommy's done. Anybody I, I talk to about addiction, I tell them about what? I tell them about Tommy Rosen and this technique I did yesterday. I was doing an endoscopy on a patient, and they said, you know, I know you're busy, but my sister's son took Vicodin for a toothache, and now it's out of control. I said, look at this. Look at his methodology. And why is it unique to me? Again, in the medical world, it's because you're bringing in techniques that your body already knows. Now it's scientifically proven. So that third pillar of spirituality is devastating. Again, and keep track. I'm talking about purpose. Adding seven years to your life, 10 studies talking about decreasing, decreasing disease, number one. Number two, you're talking about nutrition and all the evidence, right? Talking about addiction or any other disease state. Again, a very critical thing to understand in the medical world, we have a long ways to go. Yeah. Addiction is a disease, right? My, addiction my, is a disease. My father, uh, is, he's not with us any longer. Um, rest his soul. He, he was an incredible man. And, uh, he was very, um, very skeptical. He, he, he asked a lot of important questions, which, and there's a light side to that and there's a shadow side to that. But the light side of what he was doing was trying to understand, you know, why things work or why they don't work. So in my mind, I'm always sort of, I'm up against, I'm up against my dad's questioning. The thing that's so powerful <laughs> That's so powerful about, about um, well, one of the things that's so powerful about you, Dr. Nandi, is this, this, this combination of, of elements in you. I, I'm still the, the strange kid in the room. I'm, I'm teaching this strange thing called yoga and, and meditation and breath work. And, and God forbid, sometimes I even chant. And I try not to tell too many people about that. But I'm still that strange kid in the corner of the room. You are a, a medical doctor. And, and whether it's right or wrong, you carry a certain credibility that, 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 that someone like me just simply won't. And until someone maybe gets to know me a little bit, you carry an unbelievable body of knowledge and credibility as a medical doctor, and you bring in these other concepts. It's so important. Do you realize that? And this is why I think you've gotten to 90 million households and why I think you're going to get to another 100 million uh, in the years to come and 100 million beyond that in the years to come. And, this combination of things is so important. You, you, you understand? I really do. I, mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that. It means a lot coming from you because you know, you're the real deal. I think that people understand exactly what you stand for. 
but I, but I think it's a privilege, right? I mean, I don't think anything's an accident. I don't think my illness was an accident. I don't, I don't think me coming from India is an accident and, 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 you know, meeting you. And I really think that it's such a privilege. And I think more people like myself who are in the medical world are, are getting it. We're slowly getting it because we have to change the way we treat addiction, right? We have to change the entire approach. I mean, fundamentally change it. I, that woman, you know, who talked to me, you know, they've spent a hundred thousand dollars on their child. Of course. And I'm not saying that's the only thing. It's a tragedy is they would give their right arm for their child. And because of the way people are being treated, first, there's so many, you know, that nobody calls it a disease unless you're in the field, right? If you're, if you're someone who's a layperson, and I mean by, by a general doctor as well, they, they don't understand it. There's, there's so much that needs to be, that, that needs to be changed about how we fundamentally change the approach, mm-hmm. how you treat this. And, and it's from the inside out, meaning that, Absolutely, medicine's important, and, and absolutely these facilities, but really you have to take it from inside out. Spirituality, nutrition, and then everything else to code it. It's almost like, you know, when you build your house, it's, it's like talking about your paint before you even have your walls up. You know, you've got, no, you've got no, no structure, but then you're talking about paint. And that is the problem with our approach to recovery with addiction. You are painting a house that's not even stable yet. And that you keep, and unbelievably, the house collapses again and again and again. Yeah. Well, and that's fundamentally what you're doing. Yes. Well, right before we get to this fourth pillar, I just want to simply say you're getting past my father's uh, questioning. <laughs> so this is working good. I hope folks out there are getting this. Let's let's go to pillar number four. Absolutely. So I think once you've got spirituality in your mind, you know, is really on, on target. I think here's the thing, you know, we, we have absolutely crippled ourselves. Why is that? Because an average day for the average person that's in the Western world is, is this, you somehow drag yourself out of bed, right? And then you go, if you take a shower or not, perhaps you don't. And then you, you grab something to go, possibly a bar that, that claims to have everything you need for your nutrition, right? You take that and then you sit into your car and you drive to work sometimes for an hour. And then what do you do after that? You go to your cubicle and do what? Sit again, only to stand up, to go to another place to eat, and, and then possibly a vending machine where you can press C12 and something magical comes out that you can put into a heating thing called a microwave and then you go back to your cubicle and then you get back in, and then you work again and then you for four more hours and then you get back in your car and then you go right into your tv dinner which you put in another microwave and you sit back down and then after you're done with dinner you go to another place called your couch in which you spend the rest of your time i remember this young couple right when i got married and I, my first six months man i was juiced i was like let's go do something Young couple told me, well, we have an exciting time. We sit together and we have our two TV dinners and we watch TV and where we, or we sit in front of the computer. So the whole idea is we have engineered movement absolutely out of your life. And now with, with, these, with virtual reality, you don't even have to leave your house if you don't want to. Who needs to even walk outside to see a game? You can put these goggles on and you can watch the game, right? So the entire... The entire idea is that you don't have to move. If you want food, you go through a drive-through. You don't have to get out of your car to make the big adventurous step to go into the thing, into, into to order food. So why is that important? Because when you engineer movement out of your body, your body is designed to move. It's done that because it is, for thousands of years, it's the way you survive. Why is that important? When you're sedentary, right? When you're sedentary and you, you create this complete unrest in your body. Number one, all of the diseases in your body completely get a big uplift. So obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, strokes, etc. But guess what also happens? The flora in your gut, those 30 trillion little bugs that you see change. Change because of your activity. Not for the good, but but for the bad. And if you're somebody who is trying to beat addiction and you're all you're seeing, all you're doing is going from the couch to your home to bed and not movement, two things happen. First of all, 
your the flora in your in your gut completely changed to a negative to one that's negative because also associated with my third pillar and my second pillar, which is decreasing in spirituality and eating foods. Because if you're cooking and you're making your foods from scratch, you're typically not sitting down. You're active. You're going to the grocery store. You're going to the market. All those activities are are bred in within movement. Again, every disease state that we know, including recovery, is also increased in success when you move. And guess guess what? When you are somebody who is trying to achieve other activities besides addiction, you got to get out there and do something more than just sit at home and look at the same images that got you there, right? So your television, your internet, it's all good. Nothing's wrong with them. But it's all, only in small doses. You've got to walk out there and do things. We now know that when you go outside, right, and you have sunlight and you have what's outside in your environment changes the, the, all of the neurotransmitters that are, that are in your body and gives you a fighting chance to recover, a fighting chance to do something. Whatever you enjoy, whether it's walking your dog, going in the park, playing a game of baseball, whatever, it doesn't have to be something tremendous. You don't have to go out and, you know, the whole idea behind moving in our society is what? Running 55 miles or not the, the ultra marathon until you're just, you know unbelievably fit or lifting 500 pounds and, and then dropping it to watch and see if somebody's actually heard that big drop of the weight that is not movement huh? that is not movement and, and i would go as further as saying is that movement with purpose is the way your body really gets in shape and i don't mean shape as muscles i mean in shape inside spiritually the reason why our body was engineered to move is because we needed that to survive. So what, what I'd love to ask your, your, your listeners and viewers is that do something that's purposeful, right? If you need to get something done, do it with movement. You need to go to the grocery store and it's five minutes away. Don't take your car. If you need to get your kid from school and if it's close, walk there. If you need to go up, up to the second floor to get something, you know, don't ask somebody to get it, go up there. So again, take movement, and associated with purpose, it's more successful and your body benefits more. And for addiction recovery, it's critical to find activities besides your addictive behavior to be able to do it. Now, I don't mean by that replace one addiction for another. I've had, I've had a number of my patients who have been addicts who now then become movement addicts, right? I mean, all you're doing is exercising and, 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 and you know, doing something to an extreme degree. For a small amount of time, if you need to do that, it's fine. But I think for a long period of time, sustain movement, but within, within your life so it's purposeful and you stay in balance. That idea of balance is super important. But I think that's really, really critical to talk about my fourth pillar, which is movement. And my fifth, which is as important as anything else, is what you're doing right here, which is what? Community and tribe. Mm. Human beings, we've been able to survive beyond dinosaurs, right? We've been, we've been able to survive amazing, amazing tragedies. And why is that? Because we survive in tribes. One of the best examples is an uh, Italian community that, that and I, maybe you've heard of this one, Tommy, but they, they uh, you know, settled in the 1950s and they settled in a community in Pennsylvania. And what happened was they did everything that everybody did, right? I mean, they ate the same kinds of foods. They were pretty much like every other American, except for one thing. They cooked together. They ate together. They partied together. They lived together in generations. And a cardiologist happens, happened to find them. And they were in a, a county called Rosetto, and it's called the Rosetto effect, if you look it up. And what happened was the cardiologist could not believe that they in the heyday of heart attacks, right? Everybody in the 50s, you know, they're eating their, their greasy food and all, all, all these families outside of this Rosetto community were having heart attacks. Well, this cardiologist couldn't find a single man less than 60 with a heart attack or a woman. In fact, to find somebody who, did, who died before the age of 80 was unheard of. He didn't understand what was going on. The only difference between the Rosetto community and everybody else was what? Tribe. And what tribe does is give you the support that you need to be able to survive in every endeavor. Just Whether have, it's, yes. 
I just have to jump in and just simply say that uh, in, in recovery from addiction, uh, it's the number one above, above even these other four pillars. It's the number one for us. We don't make it in recovery by ourselves. We can't. Uh, addiction is a dis-ease of isolation. The antidote to that is community tribe uh, and, and recovery is not possible without it. Please continue. No, and, and I will go as far as to say that humanity will not survive without community. Mm -hmm. And we have a crisis of isolation. As we've done this interview, not less than 60 people have tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And that is our state of human isolation today. Today, as we're speaking, so you're absolutely right, it's the number one factor for uh, recovery from addiction, but it's, it's, it's basically the number one cure for us to survive as human beings. Because what's happened is that with all of our so-called innovations, we've actually not needed to, to do anything for survival, right? Meaning that not need anything with, with the community. We can actually live, live alone and be isolated. But what happens is something amazing is that the, the, all of your symbiotic factors, all the factors that keep you in balance are completely out of, out of, out of uh, whack. And they're not in not in sync. And that is why there's, there's so much, as you call it, disease, dis-ease, discontent. And, and the feeling of isolation is so powerful. And that is one of the main reasons why there's a crisis of suicide around the world, not just in the Western world. So, you know, and what, what has happened, I talked about the Rosetta effect, that the community and the support, when you look physiologically, I'll go back to that same paradigm, the fight or flight effect, right? When you are supported by your community, no longer do you have the fear, no longer do you have the lack of understanding of what's going on. You have your, your community to support you. In Okinawa, right? Okinawa, Japan, until recently, they had five people that they, that they called their tribe. And those five people stayed with them. It doesn't mean that they're biologically related, but what they did was they, they gave the support that you need to, to not just survive, but thrive. And so, you know better than most people, more, more than anybody on the planet, how important it is for recovery and addiction. It is so important to me in my practice that I tell people with Crohn's disease, with inflammatory bowel disease, people who have ulcer disease, reflux, as well as addiction. Because, you know, nobody comes with just one problem. They come with an array of problems. I tell them the same thing, that with your community, you can survive and thrive. The accountability is huge, but that accountability physiologically leads to what? That feeling of belonging, the feeling of unrest decreases, just like the same ideas of purpose. When you have purpose, that feeling of not belonging and not understanding what you're here for is, is decreased a significant amount when you have your tribe. So the fifth pillar, which is as important as the rest, is having a tribe. And it, like, here's the cool thing. Each one of these pillars are formidable, right, by themselves. When they come together, it is unbelievable. It's a force of nature. So my kids, if you, if you talk to them and you'll meet them, Tommy, uh, we go to India together, is that if you ask them who my favorite superhero is, they will not say Superman. They will not say Spider-Man. They'll say Batman. And, and so people say, why do you say Batman, Dr. Andy? So I say, Batman because... He really doesn't have any superpowers, right? This guy is just like a regular dude, but he's got an arsenal of weapons with him, right? He's got this great car and this in his belt and that in his belt. And I think to me, the five pillars make you a superhero like Batman. And I really mean that because you can take stuff that's really simple, right? None of these ideas are, are such that you can't follow them. When you take them and you put them together, they're really a force of nature. I mean, if you're thinking about beating recovery, if you look at those five pillars, I think it's an unbeatable, unbeatable source of weapons for you in the fight to save your life. It's, it's, it's a fight for your life. And to me, when I extend it to other disease states of humanity, it's really a fight for our life. What's happening to our planet is that chronic disease, including addiction, is ravaging our, 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 our entire planet. We need to take a step back. And I think using these five pillars is such an important way to do that. Mm. Dr. Nadi, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna underline what you just said and simply say, uh, the treatment center of the future 
will be based on these five pillars. Mark my words that when we catch up to what we know and, and, uh, and, you know, maybe you and I will put together that treatment center someday, um, hopefully someday soon, because when treatment is based on these five pillars, uh, I truly believe we'll start to see the outcomes that are necessary in the treatment of addiction and, and that we'll start to see people and, and families uh, and society heal at a great level. So thank you so much for laying it out so succinctly for everybody. How, how can people uh, connect with you, uh, learn about your show, learn about all your offerings and everything that you do? I think, um, you know, we're giving a, a, a gift to most of your uh, viewers who want to um, jump, jump on board, which is I have a superfoods cookbook. So it goes through a couple of the pillars, you know, it's just getting great stuff in your body with the fork, but also the tribe when you cook with your family and, and also, you know, using using techniques to get out of the house to be able to get the, the stuff that you want. But if you go to askdrnanny.com, so you go to the website, you'll learn a lot about me and and I would love to be able to partner with you to have the recovery center for the future. It, it's not just something that's needed. It's, it, it, it's, it's absolutely vital for the survival because this is not a problem that's going away. It's just ever expanding. And I think we need a fundamental new approach. So I really thank you by for doing this and, and using all your energies. Um, and I know personally how it's touched our family. So you know, I, would, I want to say namaste to you for doing that. Namaste. Thank you so much, Dr. Nandi. I can't wait to see you again. Give my love to your whole family. I will do the same. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Very much.